Hi, thank you. Um, can we raise the house lights for a minute, please? I have a couple of questions for you. Raise your hand if you sing. If you sing. Okay, how about in the car? Do you sing in the car? Okay. Okay, raise your hand if you draw. If you draw. All right. So, interestingly enough, if I were to ask a room full of kids, do you sing or do you draw? Every single kid in the room says, I sing, I draw. In fact, they'll start singing and drawing right on the spot. <laughs> We'd have all kinds of craft going on, and I'd try to settle the room down.、Um, but let me ask you this. What happens is, around the age of eight, is the inner critic arrives. So we start to draw and we sing, and we all do this as kids. And then around the age of eight, we start to question is this drawing going to make the refrigerator? <laughs> is my teacher going to like this? And so we start to distill down to, you know, I'm not great at this, and therefore I'm going to just not do it. So, One other quick question I have for you is Do you have a really big idea that you haven't acted on yet? Raise your hand if you have a big idea that you haven't acted on yet. In any part of your life, it doesn't have to be a business idea, just any idea. So, my name's Chris Waugh. I'm 36. I'm from San Francisco, and I work at IDEO. I design for IDEO in the area of well being. So, I profoundly believe that design is a tool to help people realize their potential. I also believe in an expansive definition of design, in that every one of us in this room is a designer. We design our days, we design our lives, we design our calendars, we design our interactions and our relationships, and what we do in society. So I'm going to tell you a little story as to how I came to this realization about design. And it starts here. This is Barb and Ken, my parents. Not to be confused with the more popular <laughs> Barb and Ken. In fact, this would be a very different TED talk if the Barb and Ken on, the, on your right were my parents. But <laughs> Barb and Ken were also very cool, you know, a good time. Barb, Barb was a lot of fun. Ken's a CPA in Colorado Springs, started his own firm, very driven guy, and learned a lot from him. And Barb, office manager who just had a knack for. Joking and creativity. I never once played a board game with my mother where she didn't cheat. She cheated on every game. So half the fun was just watching how she was going to cheat. And she would pull pranks. Once I bet my mother, would you walk up to that guy over there and take a bite of his hamburger? Perfect stranger. Sure enough, she did it. And one year for April 1st, April Fool's Day, she saved the newspaper, the April 1st newspaper, for an entire year. She put it out for my father the following year on April 1st. He read the entire paper, got to the stock market, and thought, wait, I thought the market went down yesterday, and this says it went up. She blurted out, April Fools, and then ran upstairs to my sister and I and said, guys, it's a snow day. This is in Colorado. Snow days are the best thing ever. Don't look outside, but it's a snow day. And we'd look outside and go, Mom, not again, right? She did that one every year. And we always fell for it. My parents did a great job raising my sister and I, and this is me、uh, riding my first big wheel. Remember your first bike or your first big wheel? It's the coolest thing ever, right? It meant freedom. And here I was on my first big wheel. We drove this thing into the ground. From the, the tires went from round to, to squares. And, and this lit up a passion for me, this sense of freedom. Never stopped on a bicycle. In fact, I started racing bicycles, and my dad would take me to all kinds of events, and my mom would cheer me on. And, and that led me around the world as an athlete in Mexico and Italy, racing my bike. And finally,、um, I did Ironman New Zealand in 2005. And at Ironman New Zealand, I was kind of tired when I got to the run. And lo and behold, there's Barb, and she's managed to rally up 50 Kiwis. All chanting drunk, completely intoxicated, <laughs> chanting my name, Chris, Chris, Chris. And the hair on the back of my neck stuck up, and I ran that marathon as fast as I could. It was a great day. Thanks. But to be honest with you, this wasn't enough. Something was missing. Something was missing. I wanted to know could you inspire other people? This was all about me. And it started to feel kind of self centric. Could you inspire other people? 
Could you get more people involved in this? In 2004, I got a call from a friend, and he said, "Hey, you know, would you want to coach team in training?" <laughs> and team in training is a group of individuals. They'll come together. Anyone can participate, and they raise money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And in return, they get me, which is kind of a scam, right? It's not the best thing. <laughs> and I, I coach the team in training Silicon Valley chapter. And every year we take a group. In fact, next week we take another group off to Hawaii to do their first triathlon. But what inspired me is I showed up, and all you needed to do as a coach and as a design thinker was identify the moments that mattered. And if you could shine a mirror up to people of their potential in a moment that mattered, they would complete their goal. They would realize their vision. So since 2004, we've taken、uh, about 500 people to, through their first triathlon. And they've raised over 1.8 million dollars for for the Cancer Society. Which was a brutal coincidence, because in 2007, Barb called me. Barb said, "I've been diagnosed with cancer." <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't supposed to choke up at this part, but、um, she said, "It's anal cancer." And it was not sexually transmitted. <laughs> Anal cancer is a rare kind of cancer. She said Farrah Fawcett has it too. And、uh, and we're going to get through this. So with optimism, as always, we proceeded through 2007, and the news became progressively worse. In the fall of 2007, we found out that she was not going to make it. And so I took those moments. And I packed up my bags and I moved in with my mom in hospice for the last three weeks of her life, and it was brilliant. We knew it was all we had, so we had fun. We had visitors. We had positive visitors only on the door of her hospice room, and she would scream out for Bud Lights and whatever you know, whatever would happen. <laughs> and we had a wonderful time, and we had heavy talks, and of course it was sad, but we also knew it was all we had, so we were going to make the most of it. And one day she called me over. It was a horrible day. She's in tons of pain, and she signaled me over, and she brought me in Carillos, and she said, "Chris, I need to tell you something." And I was waiting for, you know, always treat your children with respect or whatever it would be. And she said, "Your real father is the milkman." <laughs> And we laughed and laughed and laughed, and so the the next day, so we had a lot of fun, and this went on and on and on. That was just one story. The next day, I mustered up the courage to ask her a serious question, and I said, "Mom, are you afraid to die?" And she said, "You know, I'm not afraid to die, but I am very afraid of the journey from here to there." And that really struck me. I thought, "Wow, what incredible courage for her." And yet, this journey stuck in my head. On October 24, 2007, my mother passed away. The following day, an idea hit me that I needed to take a journey too. So, two days after her funeral, <laughs> I got on my bike and I went on a parallel journey into the unknown and just said, "I don't need to go back to work right now. It's the last thing I want to do." I want to go into a parallel journey into the unknown. So I decided to ride my bike home from Colorado Springs to Half Moon Bay, California, where I lived at the time. And I started a blog. I'm not a blogger, and I invited all my mom's friends in the blog and friends and family. And people thought this was a little crazy, but they're like, "Whatever, you're crazy. You've done Ironman New Zealand. You'll do anything." But it was also really foreign to me because I didn't know what the emotion was going to be like out there, and I just needed to get out and, and go. So. The journey began, and I want to read from you a few notes from the blog. What would happen is I would do the full day's ride, and I'd go home and I'd tell the story of what happened. And my my friends and my mom's friends would tell me stories about her life. On November 5th, I got to thinking, "Gosh, this is a lot of crap to carry around from Colorado Springs to Half Moon Bay. This is pretty heavy stuff. What if you had to carry everything you owned?" And it was a metaphor for life. I got rid of everything as I went through, and I realized at the end of the trip, this is all you need. I don't need that much stuff. So what if you had to carry everything? On November 9th, I was in the middle of nowhere, and I had heard this myth that horses sleep standing up. 
And that is not in fact true. Horses sleep lying down if they want to. I saw several of them out there in the middle of nowhere doing this. So humor crossed my mind. And on November 12th, as I neared California, the towns were about 100 miles apart. And you had to chase the light, because to get from one town to the next, each day was about 100 miles. And I was chasing the light to try to make it happen, to fill the day. The days were short. How could I get there? And sure enough, on that day in Death Valley, I didn't make it. The, the, the light went dark. And I got a flat tire. <laughs> and it seemed like a grim moment. I had only seen one car that day. And from an observation perspective, it looked like the loneliest moment in my life. And it was exactly the opposite. I could feel my mom. It was full of love. And here I was in the middle of the desert with the only things I needed to survive in the middle of nowhere. So I got back to work. And my mother passed away, and she was 58 years old. There was this tremendous sense of urgency. We don't have that much time here. We don't have that much time. And as a designer, and as designers, we've got to do things. And so I came back to my work at IDEO. IDEO is an amazing place to work. Incredible questions getting thrown at IDEO on a daily basis. And it's incredibly stimulating, and it felt like this. This is what I came back to. Hey, we could do this, we could do that, we could do this. And I knew, just like shedding the weight on the ride home of the things that I carried, that I needed to focus. And I focused in on how could we use design to help people realize their own potential in the things that they eat, the systems, the systems that we live in that get in the way of people's potential, such as the food system, such as um, the CDC, who came to us right at this time and said, we are struggling with this obesity crisis. We know the equation if people eat less and exercise more, the problem's solved, but it's not working, so we're wondering if you guys can help us innovate a new solution. And so these were the kind of programs that I got uh, deeply involved in and was really inspired by. And around this time, we also met Jamie Oliver. And about uh, a year ago, in fact, in 2010, we saw this. The statistics of bad health are clear, very clear. We spend our lives being paranoid about death, murder, homicide, you name it, it's on the front page of every paper, CNN. Look at homicide at the bottom, for God's sake. Every single one of those ones in the red is a diet-related disease. Any doctor, any specialist will tell you that. Fact. Diet-related disease is the biggest killer in the United States right now, here today. So I heard that, and I knew that design was a powerful tool, and how could we use design to sustain this revolution that Jamie started in America? And so we got together, and we got to thinking. So through TED and IDEO, there's a relationship with TED and IDEO. We said to the TED Prize, we'd like to help bring this wish to life. And a few phone calls later, we were with Jamie Oliver in New York, strategizing around how to bring the wish to life. And there were food trucks being built, and schools being addressed, and community kitchens being established. But there was one thing missing, was the mass adult population that was in a literally a, a, a disoriented relationship with food. And we all struggle with food to some degree or another. There's this broken relationship with food. So we wanted to see if we could change the relationship that adults had with food. And coming off of the experience I had um, with my mother and my life, it's like, we can really do something about this. So we got to narrowing it down to how could we change this relationship, and the answer resolved in cooking. What if we could get adults cooking again? And while this seems really simple, it's actually quite profound for the best bits in life, and that is why cook. So let's talk about that. Cooking is inherently healthy, so that's an obvious benefit. But it connects people. It's a social fabric. When we cook, we connect. We connect with the people that we love. We connect with each other. Cooking can save money. Cooking boosts self-esteem in some of the experiments I'm about to show you. Provides a sense of purpose back to the land. Creates food knowledge. And lastly, if you're not buying any of that, guys, if you learn to cook, you will get laid. I guarantee it. <laughs> So we knew cooking was important for so many reasons. But we also knew that there were a lot of barriers to cooking. And we started talking to our coworkers. My relationship to the food I eat, um, I think it's a battle. Disastrous. I don't think of it as a fun part of my day. 
Uh, and it's, for me, it's something that I have to make time for. For me, I, uh, well, I've gained quite a bit of weight in the last three or four years, and, uh, and I've pretty much narrowed it down to my eating habits and essentially my cooking habits. So we got to thinking that cooking, cooking adults, where do adults spend their time? Kids go to school. Where do, where do adults go? They go to work. Adults go to work, and work shapes our behavior. It shapes what we do with our lives. It shapes how it goes. You go there early, you leave late, and guess what? It's takeout night. And so could we influence adult behavior through companies? Companies also have this problem on their hand called healthcare costs. It's going up 25% year on year in some cases. So they're scrambling to create workplace wellness programs, which frankly look like crap right now. It's some sort of flyer in the bathroom saying, you smoke and you're overweight and you should quit because our company thinks you should. So it's not inspiring. How could we inspire people? So we started running experiments around cooking. Could we get cooking happening in the workplace? So this is my friend Alte, and he and I built a Charlie Brown stand, a lemonade stand, and we created what was the reverse omelet stand, which means you expected to come up and have us cook an omelet for you, but no, you were going to make it. And so we had people make their own omelets, and this was unannounced. We just did it at work one day, and we taught about 30 people how to make an omelet, and lo and behold, we saw them connecting, and some of the principles of cooking were coming to life. But that wasn't enough. How could we create more reach? So we went to a company called Method in San Francisco. We sent out an email through their employees, and it said, we want non-cooks to come in. And the first thing we did is we invited them to a Facebook community group, and then we recruited prep chefs, and we gave them a fajita recipe. Over lunch, they prepped and chopped fajitas for their coworkers that didn't cook. At the end of the day, those coworkers came, and they picked up the fajita prep kits, and they brought it home, and they made the fajitas themselves. So we derailed pizza night. And we asked them to send us a picture of what happened when they got home, and when they cooked these meals, what happened. So the first picture that came back was this. This is Ryan's daughter, Emma. He's an employee of Method. And it nearly teared us up because we saw that companies did have this profound role in what was happening in the family unit. So where could we go with that? More pictures flooded in to the Facebook site. So more and more came. Then we had a chef come in and teach employees how to cook. So the idea came down to, if we could teach one employee at a time how to cook, and they would reach other employees and their families, and then they could reach their communities and their regions, we could start to change the way America looks. If we could get 350,000 US employees to cook, we could change the way America eats. And so that was our goal. And three weeks ago at TED Long Beach with Jamie Oliver, we sat on a stage to a, an audience of 125 people that represented 1.4 million employees and said, can we get cooking going in your organization? And there's been a resounding yes. So we're really excited to bring this to life. I'll end on this. We don't have that much time here. You're all designers. Whatever it is in your life, sing, draw, cook, whatever it is, your big idea, go out there and get it done. Thank you very much for the time today. Thank you.